This is Professor Mark Geistfeld, the Birnbaum Professor of Civil Litigation at New York University School of Law, to discuss Greenman versus Yuba Power Products. Welcome, Professor Geistfeld. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Uh, so the Greenman case is formally the start of a new regime called strict products liability. Uh, the rule is simple to state. If there is a defect in a product and that defect causes the product to perform in a manner that injures the consumer, the consumer can recover from the manufacturer or any other commercial distributor of the product, uh, which these days includes Amazon. Um, and uh, you don't have to prove fault. You don't have to show that there was anything the manufacturer or seller should have done differently. It's just the fact that the product was defective. Um, now, there's complications about what defect means. Um, that's something that got worked out subsequent to Greenman. But the basic idea is that uh, if a product malfunctions, doesn't perform in its intended manner. So a bottle of Coke explodes. Um, in the Greenman case, it was a lathe uh, that didn't hold the wood properly and the piece of wood that the plaintiff was working on flew off of the machine and hit him in the forehead and badly injured him. Uh, and so you not that's just not how the product is supposed to perform. So it's easy to identify defect in those circumstances. And uh, what the California Supreme Court ruled in Greenman for the first time uh, that the plaintiff in one of these cases could sue in tort rather than contract, didn't have to be the purchaser of the product. In the, in the Greenman case, the plaintiff's uh, wife had purchased the lathe for him as a Christmas present. Uh, so he had no contractual relationship. He wasn't the purchaser, uh, just the user. And so the court in prior cases had required the plaintiff to have a contractual relationship uh, with the seller. And then you had to satisfy certain rules of contract law, give written notice and so on. And in the Greenman case, the court said, none of that's necessary. This is a tort claim, it's not a contract claim. And moreover, it's a tort claim that doesn't require proof of negligence or fault. Um, after Greenman is decided, uh, it's the early 60s, the American Law Institute was, was drafting uh, the restatement second of torts at that time. They had a provision about defective products that they were playing with and it had originally been limited to contaminated food and adulterated drugs. And then after the California court's decision in Greenman, New Jersey had a similar decision in the Henningsen versus Bloomfield Motors case uh, around the same time. Based on those two decisions, uh, the American Law Institute, a relatively conservative group of uh, judges, practitioners, and academics adopted the rule of strict products liability. Um, and so this gets finally promulgated and approved, let's say 64, 65, and within 10 years, uh, the rule of strict products liability has been widely adopted across the US. Um, and when the courts are adopting the rule, they cite the Greenman case over and over again. And they in particular cite the reasoning of Justice Traynor, the author of that opinion, uh, who had started on this journey of strict products liability a couple decades before in a famous concurrence in Escola versus uh, Coca-Cola, an exploding bottle of Coke. Um, and 20 years earlier, he basically made the same arguments that the court accepted in the Greenman case. Uh, Trainer said back then, there's a rule that has been in existence since medieval times uh, that has always held the seller of contaminated food strictly liable for the person who eats it and gets sick as a result of the contamination. So this is, this is a rule that has not only been around for centuries, it's actually a rule that has been recognized by a number of countries around the world. And when you buy food, you expect that it's not going to make you sick. And it's too difficult to prove whether the seller was negligent or not, because you don't know what happened in the kitchen, you don't know how they were storing the food, so it'd be very difficult to prove fault in these circumstances. And so as a consequence, 
uh, you can just recover by showing that the food was unwholesome and got you sick. And that basic logic, uh, Trainer argued, uh, with precedential support from other courts that have been developing this idea, is that there's no reason to limit this rule to contaminated food. Uh, because the fact of the matter is that the consumer doesn't know what he or she is getting. The only way you're going to find out whether the food is wholesome is to eat it. And by that point, if it's unwholesome, you're going to get sick. And maybe, you know, a few centuries ago when products were simpler and so on, you could go look at a wagon and kick the wheel and figure out whether it was properly made or not. But in the modern economy, with, with packaged goods and so on, we, it, our ability to inspect products and to figure out whether they're safe or not uh, is just simply extremely limited and not fundamentally different from contaminated food. And so the logic of liability, not limited to contaminated food, um, the logic of liability, not based on contract, but actually based on tort law over all of these uh, centuries that I was alluding to, uh, Trainer said that logic gives us plenty of uh, doctrinal support for just saying manufacturers and other product sellers are strictly liable when they sell a defective product that causes bodily injury or property damage. Um, and again, the idea early on of defect is a very simple one of malfunction. Food is supposed to be wholesome. It's not supposed to make you sick. So we can say it didn't perform its ordinary or intended function when it's contaminated and uh, causes the, the consumer to be sick. Coke bottle is not supposed to explode. A uh, wooden lathe is not supposed to let the wood fly off of the machine while it's being used under ordinary circumstances. Uh, an automobile idling at an intersection is not supposed to explode. Those kind of simple fundamental malfunctions uh, were the ones that initially got captured by this rule of strict products liability. Now then over time, the rule has expanded significantly so that the kind of defects that we address now quite frequently in products liability suits, not limited to malfunctions, of course they're still important, uh, but the more common cases today are ones in which the manufacturer didn't warn you about a risk posed by the product. So this is very common with drug litigation, for example. If you don't know about the side effects of the drug, then the manufacturer is obligated to warn you. And the idea again is if, if, this, if this drug causes a serious side effect and I'm not, I don't know about that, I take the drug and I end up getting that side effect, then the, then the product performed in a manner that the consumer did not expect. And so it's the way in which the product performance frustrates consumer expectations that is the basis of liability or responsibility for the manufacturer. Uh, and, and so you have to warn to let consumers know how the product is going to perform. And then the other important area in which the, the rule in Greenman, this is all consistent with Greenman, it's just the expansion of the rule over time, is what we now call design defect liability. And so if an automobile, for example, doesn't have an airbag in it, you can't say that the, vehicle malfunction because there was no airbag that didn't inflate in the crash, you knew there wasn't an airbag. Um, but you, the consumer, expect that the reason why the vehicle doesn't have an airbag is that it's just too expensive to put one in or it's not very effective at reducing risk or whatever. And so you just expect it's not there because it didn't make sense to put it there. Now, if a plaintiff in a tort suit can show that actually it does make sense, that the cost of the airbag is less than the, the risks that would be reduced, uh, that in fact, the vehicle should have contained an airbag. And so the vehicle performed more dangerously than I expected. It didn't need to be uh, uh, not providing me protection in the event of a crash. Uh, and so had I known you could have put the airbag in at a reasonable cost, that's the kind of vehicle that I would have expected. Uh, so we end up with, design defect liability. Uh, so basically what we have today is almost all dimensions of product performance are regulated by this rule, strict products liability, that was famously adopted in the 
Greenman case. Um, this rule now is followed not in, in its exact form, but in its basic substance uh, around the world. Uh, the European Union has a products liability directive that's very similar to the consumer expectations logic that I was talking about. Uh, Japan, similarly, has a liability rule of this sort. Uh, so extraordinarily influential. And it's comprehensive uh, because it regulates most aspects of product performance. Uh, and so as a practical matter, it is probably the most important form of tort liability. If you think about the number of products, number of product caused injuries and so on, and understand that all aspects of that uh, performance are regulated by this rule of strict products liability, then you can have a sense of the practical significance of the rule that in many respects, got off the ground in the Greenman case. Thank you. That has been really illuminating. Thank you very much, Professor Mark Geisfield. Excellent. Thanks.